Wait! Don't shoot! Get down! <gasps> we can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. The original 1998 version of Resident Evil 2 is an example of a perfect video game sequel. It's also, in my view, the best Resident Evil game ever released. Let's talk about why. I was 12 at the start of the year when the game released. It was the first Resident Evil game that I ever played, initially by having a go on my mate's PlayStation before I eventually got the console and the game for myself. It had an immediate, visceral effect on me. I remember that image at the start of the game of what I now know is the infamous turning head zombie from Resident Evil 1. But at the time, I had no context for it, and in the flattened, recalled image of the opening, it looked to young me like it was lying on the ground, perhaps on a railway track, rather than hunched over its victim. Its dead eyes and haunting rictus grin as it lay there, or as I misinterpreted it as lying there, captured my imagination and I was immediately hooked. Amongst the games that I came back to again and again as a kid and a teenager, Resident Evil 2 stands alongside Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Tomb Raider 2 as a trifecta of what I considered to be perfect sequels. There were a number of reasons for this, but as a young gamer who didn't really think all too deeply about why I did or didn't enjoy certain games, one stood out. Playing these games made it hard for me to be interested in their predecessors. In all three cases, the original games are considered classics, and deservedly so. But one game later, on the same console and with only a couple of years between them, and the amount of iteration and fine tuning is so evident that I found it genuinely hard to enjoy playing the earlier game as a result. It's also true, in all three cases, that the second game being a perfect sequel doesn't mean that it's my favourite. Resident Evil Code Veronica and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis are continually jostling for position as my favourite game in the series, whilst the Resident Evil remake from 2002 stands out as the exemplar of the survival horror genre and gameplay systems. But so much of that stands on the shoulders of Resident Evil 2. This game still remains a standard bearer for the series and the genre. But let's take a close look at it. It's actually quite famously known at this point that the original build of Resident Evil 2, scrapped at 60-80% to 80 completion, was drastically different from the finished product. So much so that Resident Evil 1.5, as producer Shinji Mikami later dubbed it, has been recreated as a playable game by the modding community. That original build featured Leon pretty much as we know him, but the character who became Claire Redfield was originally Elsa Walker, a vacationing college student and motorcycle racer. In that version, Ada Wong's first iteration was a researcher called Linda, one shop owner Robert Kendo was a second ally for Claire called John, and police officer Marvin Branagh had an extended role as Leon's ally. The 2019 remake would reflect some of this in its expanded characterization of Marvin and the unlockable Elsa Walker costume for Claire. Other changes included a more realistic police station design, enemy models using far fewer polygons to allow more enemies on screen, dynamic music, changing the pre-rendered backgrounds in response to game events, characters being able to equip protective clothing, and character models changing when they took damage. However, Mikami felt that the game would not reach the desired quality in time for its projected May 1997 release, and that the gameplay and locations were dull. As a result, Resident Evil 1.5 was scrapped to develop what became the Resident Evil 2 we're all familiar with. Another crucial change is that where Mikami planned a conclusive end to the story with this game, which would not allow for future installments, supervisor Yoshiki Okamoto proposed something different. He said that, rather than a story which ended completely with RE2, Resident Evil should become a fictional universe or meta-series, allowing for a succession of self-contained stories with common elements to be told. This approach is one of the reasons why so much of the lore and connective tissue between the games exists primarily outside of what we're able to play. It allows the director of each installment to tell their own story in their own way, and for new characters to take centre stage rather than every entry having the same protagonist like a more traditional action-adventure franchise, such as Tomb Raider. It's also why global apocalyptic events, despite being a staple of other media with zombies in, doesn't feel very Resident Evil. The difference in scale precludes the kind of stories Resident Evil as a series exists to tell. There's also the fact that zombies, despite being what Resident Evil is best known for, aren't the point of the series, but that's a discussion for another time. In rewriting the scenario for RE2, Okamoto brought in professional screenwriter Noboru Sugimura, initially on a trial basis but soon becoming a permanent fixture when he impressed Okamoto and being asked to compose the entire story. Elsa Walker became Claire Redfield, connecting this game more explicitly to the first, and the two protagonists now cross paths more explicitly. The game's iconic zapping system was partly inspired by Back to the Future Part 2, showing us a second perspective on events we'd already seen. The game was redesigned from the ground up to incorporate the changes, and whilst that was happening, the programmers worked on the Resident Evil Director's Cut, which included a playable RE2 demo to promote the new game, and apologised for its delay. The new design for the Raccoon Police Station was inspired by western-style buildings in Japanese cities, more extravagant and artistic than the original. 
But this also meant a few assets from 1.5 could be recycled. The number of zombies on screen was limited to 7, allowing for more polygons in Leon and Claire's models. Instead of their models changing when taking damage, their walking animations changed to nursing their shoulder in caution state and a dragging limp when in danger. The full motion video cutscenes were created with stop motion animations of action figures, then rendered using CG. Ada was the one character whose model wasn't finished in time, which is why she's the only major character not to appear in an FMV cutscene. The other iconic element of this game is its music. The soundtrack was composed by Masami Ueda, Shusaku Uchiyama and Sayo Nishigaki, our one track that was composed by Naoshi Mizuta. I don't know enough about music to say too much here, except that this soundtrack is easily one of my favourite video game soundtracks. The game finally released on 21st of January 1998 for the PlayStation. The Western release of the game had more violent game over screens and was more difficult than the Japanese version. It was subsequently re-released in the DualShock version. This not only incorporated the analog controls of the DualShock controller, but also included an unlockable extreme battle mode and a rookie difficulty with an infinite ammo. The Japanese version also came with a USA version difficulty. From there it was ported to PC, Dreamcast and the Nintendo 64. The N64 version is apparently something else, and you should check out the video on that by Incribin, which I've linked in the description. Resident Evil 2 has the same basic control scheme and mechanics as its predecessor. Even so, and even lacking quality of life improvements such as quick turn and auto aim, at least in the earliest PlayStation version, there's enough of an improvement in smoothness between 1 and 2 that you can feel it. And controls aren't for everyone of course, I don't want to rehash this argument every time we discuss a Resident Evil game that has them, but with the fixed camera setup these games have, I personally find it easier to manoeuvre knowing up is always forward. Having it change every time the camera changes, as with the modern controller options you see in Resident Evil Remake and the likes of Tormented Souls, is just a guaranteed way to get me muddled up. Beyond the controls, the basic survival horror systems remain intact. In most areas, your time will be spent searching for keys to open more of the map up until finally you reach a door that leads out. Puzzles and enemies block your progress. The puzzles here are mostly quite basic, lot item A into position B, made more taxing only by the distance, and potentially dangers, between the item and where it belongs. There is some lateral thinking required though, whether to line up the library bookshelves to match a picture you find, or realising that lighting a fire will give you a gem hidden behind the picture above the fireplace. Whilst they aren't exactly a test of whether you belong in Mensa, they are fun to figure out the first time, and of course, multiple replays and knowing the puzzles like the back of your hand mean faster progress. As for the enemies, they of course vary in the difficulty. Zombies are quite straightforward to take down, but will often make up for that with their numbers, or by hiding out a camera shot to surprise you. Dogs can be avoided if you've got quick reactions, or are a pain if that goes wrong, and ironically it's easier to let them back you into a corner so they're all in the same direction, allowing you to pick them off methodically. Lickers are deadly, and fast, meaning that they're better off dead if you're able. Both the giant spiders and the mutant plants are easily avoided most of the time, but will poison you if you're careless. Poison curing blue herbs are rarer than their green cousins. Then there's the bosses. In most cases, these amount to making sure you keep your distance, move a lot and shoot when you can. Stocking up on your more powerful weapons and a few heals before a fight doesn't hurt either, though some are faster than others, such as the final forms of G and Mr. X, and Mr. X in his earlier form has a nasty habit of testing your preparedness by appearing in tight hallways. Unless you're a speedrunner who can weave like a Premier League footballer through a crowd of zombies, the enemy placements incentivize careful resource management. If you know the game well, haven't played it a hundred times, you can decisively kill or dodge enemies knowing where more ammo is, whether you have to backtrack through that area, and so on, but on the first playthrough you're still figuring this out. There's no checkpoint system to boost you past your mistakes, you're back to your last manual save if you mess up, and this teaches a pretty harsh lesson about the right and wrong ways to tackle that very first run. The B scenarios, too, serve as a test of what you've learned. The puzzle solutions are the same, though Leon's and Claire's paths do take them on different routes, but you get a different set of bosses to deal with, and a slightly different loadout. This is true if you just play the two A scenarios, but on the B run you also have a persistent threat in Mr. X, different enemy placements as you make progress, and more enemies in some areas. Whilst more action oriented than the original, RE2 is still very much a survival horror game, and will push you into using those systems. You can play it like an action game or just blaze through it super fast, but that's the reward for unlocking special weapons or mastering the game, not something you can do on your first try. Speaking of unlocking things, there's an awful lot you get as a reward for finishing the game, and that's without going into different ports on different consoles which have even more. Beating Claire or Leon's A scenario unlocks the B scenario for the opposite character. Not simply the same story with a different character, but the other side of the story you've played. Nor is Claire B simply Claire A reskinned, but there are key differences, giving you four distinct versions of the campaign to play. 
Beating the A scenario for either character in under 2 hours 30 with an A or B ranking earns you an infinite rocket launcher for your next playthrough. Finishing the B scenario in under 3 hours with an A or B ranking gives you an infinite submachine gun. And finishing the B scenario in under 2 hours 30 with an A or B ranking gives you an infinite Gatling gun. Also, if you get to the RPD entrance in the A scenario without picking up any items, that will mean that a zombie Brad Vickers spawns there. He will also be there on the subsequent B scenario if unlocked on the A run. Killing him means that you get a special key for the darkroom locker, but you get two new costumes for Leon, or one new outfit plus the Colt SAA revolver for Claire. Completing both the A and B scenarios and getting an A rank on at least one of them unlocks fourth survivor mode, where you can play as Umbrella Operative Hunk, who have a fixed loadout and have to follow a set path to escape the city. And finally, completing any scenario six times with at least one A rank nets you the Tofu Survivor Mode. This sees Hunk replaced with a lump of tofu who only has a knife and a few herbs, making this the hardest mode of the game. All of which gives you a whole lot to play with for beating the game, even without the fact that repeat playthroughs are fun in and of themselves. The story of Resident Evil 2 is perhaps one of the most iconic of the whole franchise. Spoilers follow. Check the timestamps if you want to avoid them. Following the events of the first game, where the RPD's STARS team discovered that Umbrella was experimenting with bioweapons in a secret mansion lab, we see Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield entering Raccoon City, only to find it deserted, but for the zombies. The pair make their way to the police station, but are split up by a car crash and have to follow their own paths to get there. Whichever character is in the A scenario has a fairly long run through the streets of Raccoon City to the front entrance, on the way encountering gun shop owner Robert Kendo, who doesn't last very long. The B scenario character comes in via the back entrance, climbing to the second floor helipad where they witness an attempted rescue going wrong and the helicopter slamming into the building. Our A character first meets Police Lieutenant Marvin Branner, who's gravely injured. He tells them of what Stars discovered and that nobody believed them, and if it's Claire he speaks to, he mentions that they've lost contact with the Stars members. Chris Redfield's diary in the Stars office reveals that he has gone to Europe to investigate Umbrella further. The two characters reunite either in the Star's office or a little further along where they decide to split up to find a way out. In her A scenario, Claire sees a young girl fleeing from zombies before meeting Leon and tells him that she'll look for her. In her B scenario, this happens after she's spoken to Leon. As they make their way through the RPD, they have to deal with zombies and also a new horror known as Lickers. Whoever the B scenario character is also finds themselves pursued by the mysterious, powerful Mr. X. Claire blows up the helicopter wreckage in order to reach the office of Chief Irons, who has been working with Umbrella and is also a sociopath hunting humans for sport in the outbreak. She then reunites with Sherry, who believes she is being pursued by a monster. In the A scenario, this turns out to be the G-Tyrant, whilst in the B scenario it's Mr. X. In the police basement, Leon meets a woman called Ada Wong who says she is looking for her boyfriend John. Leon helps her access the cells, where a reporter called Ben is being held. Ada asks him about John, who works for Umbrella, but Ben refuses to reveal anything. He does, however, guide them to escape via the sewers. Claire and Sherry do the same through a secret passage in the Chief's office. Chief Irons confronts Claire as she investigates the passage, accusing her of being a spy, before revealing that Sherry's father created the G-Virus. He and Ben then die, the A scenario seeing them implanted with a G-Virus embryo that tears them apart, before mutating into a boss for the player character to kill, and the B scenario seeing them slaughtered by the G-Tyrant, whose first incarnation is the next boss. In Leon's B scenario, Ada before this sees Sherry, who drops her pendant whilst fleeing. Ada picks it up to keep hold of it for her. Claire and Sherry escape through the sewers, only for Sherry to fall down a grate and get lost. She ends up in the Umbrella chemical plant, injured. In the A scenario, the G Tyrant then appears to infect her with his embryo. Claire discovers Annette Birkin, who reveals that G is none other than her own husband and Sherry's father, William. Leon and Ada bump into Annette as well, who shoots at them. Leon takes a bullet for Ada, who then pursues Annette. The two fight, and Ada gets the upper hand before reaching the lower level of the Umbrella chemical plant. In the A scenario, she sees something in the water and shoots at it to keep it at bay. Leon and Claire both reunite with Ada and Sherry respectively in the same place. If it's their A scenario, then a giant crocodile emerges from the water to pursue them, and they must use explosives to kill it. Both reunited pairs then pass from the chemical plant to the marshalling yard, to take a tram to the main umbrella lab underground. The A scenario characters can take the tram straight down, and have to fight the G Tyrant's second form. The B scenario characters have to take the extra step of recalling the tram and dealing with Mr. X again as they do so, before heading down. They must then fight G's third form, and after defeating him, they have to climb through a vent into the pump room as the tram is overheated and stopped halfway. 
However, once they are through the vent, the tram restarts without them to carry Sherry or Ada down to the lab alone. Ada will be injured, having been wounded by G's claws. Sherry will be in pain from the implementation in the A scenario, but fine in the B scenario. The A scenario character will carry their wounded partner into the security room before carrying on. Both Leon and Claire power up the lab and search through it for a way out. In Claire's A scenario, she must also find the antidote for Sherry. In the B scenario, either Ada or Sherry is pursued by Mr. X for the G-Virus sample in Sherry's pendant. Sherry is saved by Claire, and Mr. X manages to destroy a central power turret to ignite the self-destruct system before falling into a fiery vat far below. Alternatively, Ada dies saving Leon, with the same result. In Leon A, Ada dies instead by being shot by Ada and plummeting off a high walkway, but not before declaring her love for Leon. Though, it must be said, their main interactions in the game have been her running off to do her own thing and him telling her in vain to wait before he finally discovers that she's a spy. Ada, wait! I don't think I've introduced myself yet. My name's Leon. I'm with the RPD. Ada, wait! What was that all about? Running off like that was reckless and stupid! Is it just me, or does everybody always ignore what I say? Ada... No... Ada! Truly the stuff of fairy tales. The player in the A scenario will find an elevator to the bottom platform and then face the fourth form of G as the last five minutes of the self-destruct timer run down. The player in the B scenario takes a different elevator and must get the emergency train started. On their way, they face the final form of Mr. X, now mutated and on fire. Ada, apparently not dead after all, appears to be the one to provide the rocket launcher that finishes the job. Game over. Leon and Claire are then reunited on the train, escaping the destroying lab. If Sherry was implanted in the A scenario, then they cure her as well. However, the B scenario reveals that this isn't the end. G's final form is to overtaking the train, and they must destroy him once and for all. The train blows up, as all umbrella locations tend to, and the characters escape into the sunset, Claire vowing to find Chris in her B scenario, and Leon vowing to take Umbrella out in his. As you can probably tell already from the kind of convoluted way I've had to tell the story, the game's zapping system allows for a lot of story variation depending on who you're playing as and which way around you do the A and B scenarios. There are also some good gameplay moments in there as well. The more obvious one is the submachine gun, which in the A scenario you can choose to either take or leave for the other character. It generally tends to be better to leave it, but you can opt not to and deal with the B scenario where you don't have access to it. Beyond that, in the final lab, you can as both characters register your fingerprints on the umbrella system and use them to gain access to an optional room. This room is only available in the B scenario after you've registered and input your fingerprints in both scenarios. It contains three liquors and an extra machine gun clip. This is something that's easy to miss on a first playthrough, and something which may not pay off if you've already opted to take the machine gun in the A scenario. It essentially acts as an extra reward for multiple playthroughs and knowing what you're doing. Whilst there are still puzzles and moments repeated across all four versions of the campaign, all of these details add up to make it still feel like four different outcomes and give some genuine variation in the gameplay and continuity and story at the same time. It's hard to talk about all of this without talking about the 2019 remake. I'm not going to go in depth here about that game on its own merits, beyond saying that it's a really well made and enjoyable game with great gameplay, and they've done really well updating a lot of the game and making the story interactions and the puzzles feel more grounded. However, in comparing it to the original, it doesn't stand out above it in the same way the remake of the first game does to the original. That feels, much like the recent Last of Us remake, like a true remake that serves as the definitive way to play that game. RE2 remake, by comparison, is a reimagining, and as much as I like it, I feel it suffers for that. It didn't have to. Changes such as Sherry's gameplay being in the orphanage rather than essentially the same exact mini area as Ada's gameplay are definite improvements, but a lack of real variation in the two scenarios leaves the zapping system feeling underwhelming, and that harms the overall product. Leon and Claire also cross paths far less. They have the same exact bosses bar the final boss, and they now both face Mr. X regardless of scenario. 
All of which means that, as good as it is as a game, the remake lacks a certain something when it comes to story delivery, continuity across scenarios, and incentive to play four rather than two runs. I still love the game, but I think a modern remaster or port of the original to the current generation consoles would make clear to so many people who have not experienced it before just why it holds such a place in the heart of at least a certain generation of Resident Evil fans. Although I've not really touched on them too much here, there are of course flaws in the 1998 version of Resident Evil 2. Playing as Sherry in the RPD sewers borders on infuriating and tedious, as does having her at your side is clear, even for short bursts, due to how easily she falls behind and sits on the ground rather than keep following. The lack of a quick turn in auto aim isn't necessary to the game's challenge, but rather a quality of life issue that the subsequent games would thankfully iterate on. Not being able to skip in-game cutscenes can get old if you're rewatching the same moments after having died, just for example. However, overall, it did what the best sequels do. It took a successful formula from the first game, iterated and expanded upon it, and delivered exactly what you would want from number 2, which, as I said at the start, puts it alongside Sonic 2 and Tomb Raider 2 as examples of how to do a sequel right. Like its predecessor, the story is still hugely corny, even if the delivery is a lot better this time, but that fits it perfectly given the 90s pop culture sci-fi B-movie horror well that it was drawing from. It was of its time, and that both worked then and holds up now as a nostalgia trip, yet it retained the horror, tension and challenge that the Resident Evil games are known for. If you've never played this game, then I highly recommend it. A modern console port would be fantastic, but from emulators to retro consoles to PC ports, there are still plenty of ways to enjoy this game out there. Now I want to know what you think. If you played it, what do you like most about it? If you've not, is it something you want to get your hands on and try? Would you buy a remaster for the latest console generation? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a like and consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content, like the video that's just popped up, which YouTube thinks you should watch next. Check out the links in the description to join my Patreon for as little as £1 per month or donate to my GoFundMe and get your name in the credits of my videos, like those rolling up now, who I want to thank for supporting me and my content. Thanks for watching and see you next time!